Hello, everybody. This is Noah and John, and we are from Urban Digs. John, we are talking Manhattan, and we got one of the best in the industry today. We got Nikki Field from Sotheby's. John, what do you think of that? Well, I think it's terrific. Um, we've wanted to have Nikki on as a guest for a long, long time, and I'm just really she excited. She didn't want to share her today. secrets. She wanted to keep everything inside and to keep it for herself. And I was trying to tell that there's no one like you. You know what I'm saying? Like you can't, you can't teach Nikki Field to someone else. You can translate some of your tips and tell what you're saying, but you know, just by giving that out, you're not going to create 10 million Nikki Fields out there. No, no. So let's without, I think without further ado, we should introduce Nikki Field. Nikki Field. Nikki Field, are you there? Good morning, Urban Diggs family, specifically John, Noah, and your thousands and thousands of followers. I, in fact, am the one that is honored here. So happy to be with the two of you. You well know that you've been providing me, my team, and Sotheby's expert real-time information for decades now. And we are only as good as the information we provide to our clients, and you are the source. Please stay my friend. Wow. I, I think, should we just end the podcast right here? Because I we're think not drive safe, everybody. I'm right. done. Bye. <laughs> Nikki, thank you so much. Well, we got listeners out there, and they want to know what's going on. Today, they're going to be a fly in the wall in Nikki Field's office. What is going on in the markets today, and what do buyers, sellers, and agents need to know? What a story indeed. May I preface my comments today on the fact that this is just one woman's perception in the bunkers, trying to get up every day and sell a piece of real estate. So it's coming from my view of the market, what I am specifically seeing, not necessarily the macro version of it, but let's start with buyers. You okay. need to know if you haven't already been informed that New York is on sale. Mm. And I personally believe that it is the single greatest buying opportunity in a generation in Manhattan. Buy now, buy low, buy even lower. And that's the mantra that we've been seeing since the first week of March. We've been very excited with the traffic of, of deals that my team has been making. And we see every single week it growing larger. Everyone still believes in New York. And we believe that the comeback actually, and this is not being just a salesperson uh, with overly optimistic projections, but we believe we were in the beginning of the comeback post COVID-19 exit. Mm -hmm. Right. When you say buy low and then buy lower, could you explain that, please? I'm excited. Thank you for clarifying this. I meant sell low and buy buy even lower. Okay, gotcha. Sell low. Listen, I'm saying this. Uh, whatever you have right now, uh, be embrace the fact that it is not the height of the market value, which was June 2015, going into 2016. Mm -hmm. Take stock in the fact that you're probably still going to get a good profit on it, but take those funds and selling at a reasonable market appropriate price and buy up, buy up and buy lower. The spread between what you're selling and what you are going to actually um, uh, gain in your buy up is going, that spread is going to be much larger as far as a ret uh, eventual return. So we're doing this a lot. These, these buyers that we're working with are not in the market. We are ferreting out, finding them, letting them know what they can do today with today's dollars. How even if you're satisfied with your seven room off of Park Avenue, we can get you into a 10 on Fifth Avenue. The spread differential be more than advantageous for a long-term exit strategy. Okay. So again, a sell low, buy lower. So you're talking about um, um, the luxury sector here. Let's just let's just define that. Um, a lot of your business is in the luxury sector. Um, that's one reason why I wanted to get you on here to talk about that. So I guess you're dividing the luxury sector into even even more categories, almost like super luxury, like a ten um, versus a seven, like you're saying here. Um, are you basically telling me that um, the 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 larger price, the the six to ten million mar market versus the the, the four to five million market or even the three to five million market, there's significant discounts between those two categories. Is that what you're saying? No, I am saying that, but you, as you well know, uh, most all of this information is anecdotal. There's so little data with closings right now. That's a tough part of valuing right now, because if we are going to be accurate advisors, credible, 
with legitimate information. We have to be really clear on not just where the market was, but where the market is. And that data is not readily available. The differential between luxury and entry level right now is volume sales. The energy and fuel is in volume. Uh, all of uh, July, we are seeing entry level. Entry level for us in Manhattan is under a million five, okay? For the last three and four weeks, we've been seeing the next tier of purchasers, which is in that three to seven million range. And they, believe it or not, in the, in the middle of, of the summer, well into the end of the summer, these buyers have been circling the market and jumping when they see an advantage. Where's the advantage? The advantage is in, with sellers that are motivated to get out. Don't forget, most of our high-end luxury owners have owned for a while particularly on the Upper East Side and Upper West Side, they've been in uh, well beyond their entry level value. They've seen heights of the market. They still see a very credible return if they exit now. Let's talk about specifically the segment of the, of the empty nesters. These are the ones that actually are leaving New York. Uh, contrary to other uh, classifications that people are talking about, these empty nesters have, have been thinking about selling for quite a while. Mm -hmm. uh, they have been looking at the tax advantages of leaving the state. They're more and more using their, their country homes, their vacation homes, and they definitely like the idea of having more warm weather months than, than uh, cool weather months. They're already in the mode to sell. They ask and they actually embrace real market advice as far as uh, pricing. Um, we have lots of those examples. We have a seller that was on the market three years ago at a $10 million property on Fifth Avenue. Um, he wasn't ready, that's some nice offers, but wasn't ready, ultimately decided he was gonna use that place a bit longer. Uh, he decided now to exit, they are retiring. We have repriced that $10 million property to a market appropriate compellingly priced unit at just under $7 million. Mm, Are we getting right. activity? Absolutely, definitely, positively. We're going to move this one probably within the week. Okay, so, so it is all about that. Um, that's good to know. Can you give me any insights into um, negotiations of the deals that you're putting together over the last couple of months? Um, in general, uh, are sellers dealing with um, what they perceive as unrealistic buyers, um, or are buyers just dealing with um, unrealistic sellers that are just not moving down? Like, what's going on out there? Okay, the leverage, um, the velocity is in the hand of every buyer out there. Uh, we lead with a very brutal, frontal attack on the sellers, letting them know whether we're representing them or representing the purchaser, the, and the perceived value of the property right now. And I say perceived, because again, the data is not there. We don't know where the market's going and for how long it'll be soft. And if we are actually at the bottom, which most of my peers believe we are, because the velocity of the activity is starting to grow. So sellers, we are extremely transparent with. We are directly clear on what they must do to price the property. What must they do? Price under value, price under perceived value. So if you can get the sweet spot where I can prove that their asking price is under value, we have a buyer. That buyer is smart enough to know, although it may not be at the bottom of the market, it's damn close enough for them to strike now. So we have a great deal of work to do with the sellers. I will tell you, thankfully, that most of them are fully aware of what's happening in the market, either through their advisors, their, their financial advisors in particular, or the press and their, their brokers. Our buyers come to these, these, this market with a different perspective. They think the market is 50% off. That's where the offers all start. You've heard it. You know those stories. Um, most of them start with a 50% under last asking price offer. Well, we get no traction. We call this the, the triple rejection buyer. What we need to do on my team is honor their offers, get them through the process of under offering, lose the property once, twice, sometimes even three times until they understand the real value of the market. It's on that third endeavor that they put in an appropriate offer, they get an appropriate counter, and here's the 
great opportunity here, and I think most of our broker peers understand this. The buyer submits the very last offer and the last terms. If they're the one that puts the last numbers on the table, they're most likely to continue through the transaction and commit. That's, that's, that's fantastic stuff. And I, you know, if I could follow up on that, you know, one of the things you were talking about just a second ago was the perception of value. And it's really difficult in a market like this, because when you talk about a buyer's perception of value, they're trying to picture this market decreasing for the next five years. And so their perception of value is completely lower than when you think about a seller whose perception of value is what the market was five years ago at the, at the height. And I'm curious, you know, when you actually get down to the nitty gritty of the conversation with the stubborn sellers or the stubborn buyers, I mean, what, what sort of, how do you frame that perception of value to, to ground it back into reality, especially right now when we, as you mentioned, we don't have those comps, we don't have those, that really real time data to support um, what's happening, you know, instantaneously just because the, the, the volume is low. It all has to do with motivation on both sides of the transaction. How motivated is the seller to actually get out? I mean, this, this, is a market that sellers need a comfort level and the stomach for understanding that they miss the height, mm -hmm. um, that what their neighbor may have sold for three years ago is not what they're going to be realizing. If they're a motivated seller and they trust their real estate advisor and we give them the compelling information about the competition in the market, the perception of the buyer in the market, the, the uh, appetite of, for the, of the buyer in the market, they will listen and they will embrace the appropriate price. We've been very successful with this. We have, right now my team, uh, we have 11 deals in contract, all of them uh, Corona deals. It all happened since May, March 15th in this time of the Corona uh, economy. This was a heavy lift. I'm sure John and, and Noah, you're finding in all of our listeners out there that are involved in this industry, you're finding this is not your grandmother's real estate market anymore. This is not open up a door, throw out some comps and get a buyer to put in an offer. This is deeply driven uh, compellingly provided information on the prospect of the current market the prospect of the eventual return and the opportunity in the market. Real sellers listen to these offers. Real sellers trust their brokers to bring to them the highest possible price that this particular buyer is willing to pay. They then make the decision to strike or not. Right. I mean, hey, Nikki, um, let's say you're pitching a seller that, that is stubborn on price, but it's a great listing. It's a great, it shows well, it's unique, but you know, like let's say, let's say they, they, they got a property that's really worth, I don't know, 2.2 million or something. Um, and it's a good 2.2 million, right? And they're, they're, they're not willing to, to list below three. Um, what would you do? Would, would you take that listing? How would you handle that seller? Well, that's a great question because we've been dealing with quite a bit right now. Uh, we've turned down uh, more business than we've signed up in this environment. Um, unrealistic pricing, unrealistic expectations are a waste of everyone's time. But most importantly, it affects my credibility. It affects um, the, the value of our insights. So if we have a seller, a current exclusive, and a seller that is not willing to adapt their price to the current conditions, because we all were on a freeze um, between March and June, we fire that seller. We just do. We tell them that we can no longer represent them. This is not a market that benefits their time and our efforts. We're there for them when the market returns and if they'd like to work with us at that time. If we have, and we do have many, many, many people right now that are testing the market. Mm -hmm. They're not necessarily sellers, but they just want to know what they have, where their property now fits uh, as far as value. Uh, we're directly realistic with them. And if they tell us that that 2.2 value property that we want to price actually at 1.9, we recommend strongly should be at 1.9, in their mind can only go out at 2.9 or 3, 
We thank them and we tell them that we look forward to working with them at another time in another market. Other brokers will take that because it's interesting and it's sexy and it's fabulous. There's no reason to spend your effort right now with a fantasy sale. They're fantasy sales and we are professionals that are in this game to do the right thing. Right. Um, and, and, and when you say no and you turn down that business, how often do they come back to you and say, all right, um, I'm willing to talk. Thank you for that question. <laughs> Nine out of 10 times. That's, that's what I was curious about. First of all, smart sellers do um, sample uh, brokers. I, I always encourage them to do that. I always say, I'm very comfortable. I believe you should definitely get other valuations. Uh, it's wonderful to know what other people's perspective are. I think we give a compelling reason why we know our market, we know where the targets are for purchasing, and then we deliver. Uh, we generally see them come back to us, actually, very soon after evaluation, saying, this is not what I was hoping. They try to negotiate often, and that uh, $3 million aspirational seller will say, will you take it at, at 2.5? And I will say to him, if you're, ser if you're serious about net selling, you can put it on at 2.5. You'll have to put it on with another brand. Uh, if the market changes, I'm there for you. If you want to sell today, if you want to sell in this market, follow advice, we'll get it done for you. We, we had a really great experience with uh, Susan Sarandon. I can use her name because it's been all over uh, the news recently. Uh, Susan came to us with a property that in its day, which is just three years ago, uh, fantastic loft uh, down in um, uh, Soho was worth around $10 million. Mm -hmm. We valued it about a year and a half ago at a little over nine. And we were about to run it out. Susan had some things to do with the, the property. She had guests coming in. She put it on hold. She called us back in uh, March and said, I'm ready to go. And she understood. We made a comment. Uh, argument for the correct pricing in today's market. She accepted and embraced our asking price of seven nine. Within six days, we had it in contract, very close to that number. That's fantastic. Uh, it, you know, if I could. That's the real market. Yeah, not not to interrupt, but I feel like everything that you've been talking about for the last few minutes. I mean, the, the core of it all is the trust that a, that a that a consumer has in their professional broker, and. You know, I, obviously, clearly, I mean, you, you've mastered this, this game, and I, I would just love if you could walk through us, you know, take us through a day with your team, and, and especially now in this changed new real estate environment with, during a shutdown. I mean, how did you manage to stay on top of your clients, your listings, and just the market in general? Well, call it divide and conquer. Uh, we have a, I'm really fortunate. I have a team of 24. Uh, four of, of the team members have international guests, so they are not on day to day with us. They just um, uh, refer in international business. We, I speak to them every other day to find out through the temperament uh, and the, um, the interest for these international buyers because, although it's not a direct answer to your immediate question, John, I anticipate the international buyer is gonna take us out of this crisis just like they did after 9-11 and just like they did after the financial debacle of 2008. They see the opportunity. They're the, the buyers that we've been working with. Uh, those are the buyers that have cash in hand that see, new, see the U.S. in particular. New U.S. is, sorry, the United States as a whole and New York in particular as a real opportunist market. So here we are with our day in the life of a team member. Um, we take a number of team members who, who specialize that day in research, uh, real-time data on what's going on. What does that mean? Calling other brokers. Are you getting offers? What kind of traffic have you had? Why did you price this way? Can, uh, when you have an accepted offer, can you give us an indication? We need to know what's happening today, not last week because we are all about our advice. We have another group, five, of uh, brokers that have been on site since phase two in our offices showing and valuing properties. These guys are in the trenches with their masks, with their uh, sanitizer, and with their COVID forms showing nonstop. We have another group of team members who have not re-entered into New York yet, but they are the, um, they're the originators of deals. Uh, they are talking to sellers. They are definitely um, 
excavating for buyers. As I started off this conversation, uh, we've been going to people that don't know they're in the market, had no idea that they had an opportunity to buy up, buy big and buy low. Uh, they're talking to them and they're creating buyers where there were none. Those are our most successful deals. Uh, the day also involves a tremendous amount of, of gratitude. Gratitude, uh, not only for the industry we're in, I mean, if you can survive in this industry and if you can extend yourself into this new market with a severe pivoting of your skill sets, you're a really good professional. And I've been working with a lot of really good professionals in the last five months. Our peers, our co-brokers from other agencies that know their stuff. And I'm finding this personally, not just the most challenging time in my industry, but the most rewarding. These brokers are really good. Here's what we've done. The fraternity of brokers that you are part of. We are no longer negotiating uh, adversaries. We are facilitators. We are both on either side of the deal looking to make the best possible transaction for our clients where we have a fiduciary responsibility. How do we do that? Through a, a, a facilitation, an understanding of the of each other's perspective and a clear communication on expectations on each side. We're facilitating better solid deals than we ever have before. Why? Because old skill sets, the old type of scorched earth negotiating would only now deliver in this market combustible deals. What I mean by that is you need a solid deal where everybody feels really good on both sides. They understand that both have taken a hit and both have at least accepted that they've done the best they could to get that person from that wonderful email that says accepted offer all the way to the closing table. Yeah, and this is this is just, I mean, you just put a bunch of nuggets in there. You put a whole recipe um, for, yeah. for building a business, scaling a business. If you're a broker listening to this and you're on your on your own and you're in, you know, your your thoughts of making a team in, involve, you know, hiring one or maybe two other people, you're in that position. Think about what Nikki said in, in the sense of um, you know, this team was doing research, this team was cultivating leads this team's working on message. So, I mean, if you don't have a team to do all that, you're the team. So you take, you know, a quarter percent of your job and you do the data research and a quarter percent of your time. You take another quarter percent of your time and you do the, the message, the social messaging and the content and all that kind of stuff. You take another quarter percent of time and you do that lead cultivation. You know, um, you never knew who, you never know who your next client's going to be. We had Jared Anthony on uh, uh, last podcast, John. He was talking about former renters. Mm -hmm. That's where you dig into former renters and, and talk to those guys. And they're, they're starting to look like they're, they're active buyers and you usually wouldn't be cultivating that, that lead sector. This is really cool. Nikki, um, we're, we're getting towards the end here. Uh, and it, you gave me a whole recipe for building a nice business, a nice team. But if I, if I had to ask you for um, some secrets to long-term success for the New York City real estate agent, how would you end this podcast and, and, and how would you answer that question? This is like the EF Hutton moment. So when Nikki Field speaks, everybody listens. This is the core of a successful career. I believe in any business, not just in real estate. Um, it's solidifying the relationship. I consider myself a portfolio advisor. What does that mean? Most of our clients will buy and sell more than one property. But even if it's only one, I need them to understand that they can trust me. I need them to understand that I will tell them what not to, to buy. I will tell them what not to bid and what not to pay. They need that sense of trust just like they do with any other of their financial advisors. My secret has always been specialization. I started my career as a specialist. I have reinvented myself six times in the 20 years I've been in this business as when I pivot to wherever the market is going. Not where the market is, but where it's going. What does that mean? Follow the money. So as you are building these relationships, as you are building the trust with your clients long term, um, and just let me, and I know we're near the end, but I want to tell you, my very first sale was $139,000. Um, a studio to a young single woman. That was back in 1996. Since then, we've had 10 transactions. Her last purchase with me 
was a $12 million townhouse. Wow. She trusts my advice. I tell her when to get into the market. I tell her when to get out. She would never think of taking anyone else's advice. Why? Because it's proven. I've made her money over and over again. I truly believe anyone listening to this, particularly the new people that are in the market, this is their time. I'm very excited about the new broker. Their skill sets actually are better than mine, better than many of us experienced brokers. They have a clearer, unfiltered understanding of today's technology and today's marketing skills. We're relearning them as old timers, all right? And we're trying to adapt to them. It's hard to get rid of all of our old skill sets and get them out of our brain because they still affect our responses. But new brokers are at the same starting gate as, as myself. They have the same ability and talent. And Noah, the advice you just gave them, if they're a single practitioner, try to be, try to understand all, uh, the entire circle of what you're providing to your client and they too will build a business like I did. Yeah, and 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 I mean, you you pivoted six times. You mentioned, um, you know, uh, I've pivoted a number of times with Urban Digs, and I'm starting to realize where my true calling is. Um, that is a good thing. Um, and don't think it's not. Don't be married to something if it's not working. And if you if you discover something along your ways, along your mistakes learn from those mistakes and pivot to where the activity is and pivot to where the money is and, and always adapt. Amazing advice. Uh, John, you got any final thoughts for Nikki? Or, or no, I, 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 I would have asked what the secrets of success are like you have, Noah, but I, I okay. think that in a nutshell pretty much sums up everything. I mean, there's a, a whole new generation of digitally fluent people who are coming and everything's text-based and chat-based and it's a bit jarring if you're not, if you didn't grow up with it and you don't sort of know how it works, but they're going to figure it out um, and they are going to be the new crop of uh, power, power brokers in the next yeah. few years. So, um, you got to learn it. You got to learn it. Great advice. This has been amazing. Nikki Field, thank you so much for joining us. This is John Walkup. My name is Noah Rosenblatt. We are from Urban Digs. We're talking Manhattan. We'll catch you next time. Thank you, Nikki.